um, RICOSH, which is the Rhode Island Committee on Occupational Safety and Health, that's their job to help workplaces understand the hazards. All right, that's their job. And um, you have resources out there if you're an employer to kind of you know help you understand, to communicate to your staff about the hazards of certain things that you're working with. So let's get to the interesting stuff here. What are the things that we can that we have been finding in products that kill COVID that are a major concern? These three listed right here are have been identified by an organization in Massachusetts called the Toxic Use Reduction Institute. They are a section of uh, U University of Massachusetts Lowell, and they are a research-based organization to reduce the amount of toxins in our environment that human that to protect human health and environmental health. So they are also part of a organization called the Product Stewardship Institute that otherwise known as PSI, they um, are constantly out there protecting consumers, identifying products that are bad. So these are the three that we really wanna look out for as far as COVID. Bleach, quaternary ammonia compounds, we all refer to them as quats and phenols, right? So I'm gonna go over some of the things that where you find them. And I actually have a photo of a product that I saw at Home Depot yesterday that contains quats. So everywhere you can imagine, you're gonna find them in products, okay? Um, so bleach, we've all used it. It works great to kill, you know, especially bacteria and viruses, but we've all breathed bleach in and we know it's an asthmogen. I think one of the hardest things to get people to not use like bleach or things that smell good uh, when they clean is because people associate that with cleanliness. Uh, cleanliness doesn't have to smell to be clean. Uh, so that is one of the biggest roadblocks we hit. Um, people have their things they use, they like to work with, you know, spick and span, uh, pine salt. That smell makes you feel, ah, things are clean. That smell of bleach makes you think things are clean. But in reality, it's not any cleaner than it would be if you were using something that was safer for you to breathe in. All right, so bleach, especially is dangerous when you can mix it with ammonia, right? That's what happened in Massachusetts with that worker and he passed away, unfortunately. Um, bleach should never be used on stainless steel, aluminum, copper, brass, um, all the surfaces there. It's a disinfectant, not a cleaner. So it's not gonna clean a surface. Remember, you have to clean before you disinfect. Um, actually, if you don't clean before you disinfect, the, the effectiveness of the bleach to kill bacteria can be neutralized by the dirt. So then it doesn't even work, all right? So clean before you disinfect. Uh, the hazard of having to use other cleaners and conjunction with bleach is the dangerous part, all right? That, that uh, possibility of mixing something that's not compatible with bleach can be very dangerous. Now, the quats. Now, these are all over the place. I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, they are everywhere and they are found in the majority, I would say the majority of disinfections to, disinfectants to kill COVID, SARS, uh, SARS virus, um, that are on EPA's registered list of approved COVID disinfectants to kill the virus. And they're everywhere. Um, so knowing what they, how to identify them is a good thing to teach you guys because then you'll be able to choose safer alternatives. So they're basically a group of chemicals that have short-term and long-term health issues. They can actually be pretty bad. Um, they can cause dermatitis to the skin, uh, quats can be found in pesticides, uh, and it's been proven that farmers who use it have higher rates of chronic respiratory issues. Quats are asthma inducers, so they're asthmogens, um, and they aggravate pre-existing asthma conditions. And this is also something too, if the janitorial community, um, which you know can, can have a higher um, immigrant population, um, if you couple that with an immigrant population living in more of an urban area, uh, residents of urban areas have a higher rate of asthma already just because the air quality is not as good as if it was in a rural area. If you couple that with a workforce uh, who is you know, predominantly working in the janitorial field, then you have a double whammy right there as far as pre-existing asthma conditions and then being aggravated more with using cleaning products with these uh, components. So three separate studies have been done. Disinfectants containing quats were used to clean the cages of lab mice. Uh, decreased fertility and reproductive issues were found in the mice. So there's a possibility that quats, um, there is science out there to say that, but uh, there may be, you know, there is, 
but the quats have, you know, really have shown in several studies to have uh, reproductive issues on mice. Um, and some of the quat residue in those cages lasted months and months. So that exposure then lasted months and months. So here's a list. Now, I know this is pretty heavy on the chemistry here, but if you were to take a picture of this, the next time you go to Walmart, Target, Home Depot, wherever, and you just look to see in the cleaning section, if you can find one, guaranteeing you're gonna find many. Um, it, sometimes they don't actually list it, which is the problem, right? You have to actually look, go on the company's website, look at the SDS sheet, and then actually determine whether or not it's one of the active ingredients. However, this picture I took, and I'm not going to name all these because, you know, you can see for yourself, it's like alphabet soup. But um, if we go on the next page here, this photo, uh, now I'm not promoting or I'm not um, advocating for not using any products here. I just want to put that out there. Uh, but this is just something that I saw on the shelf. Uh, it says it right here. If you look for the active ingredient, now this should be on a label that you that you look for, but it says this top one. Go back to the slide. It says benzyl clonium chloride. All right, that is a quat, and it is in this product. All right, so you can easily identify which ones have these things. I'd advocate for you to not use any products that have these in there, just for the reasons we went over. All right, so how next we have phenols. Phenols are a little bit, uh, they're a little bit harder to find in products, but they are there. Um, phenols are asthmogens according to the Collaborative for Health and Environment's uh, Toxicant Disease Database. The Toxics Use Reduction Institute at UMass Lowell that I mentioned specifically recommends against using, using any products that contain phenols. So what does it mean to be safer, have safer cleaning and disinfecting and why should you care? Well, you should care because it protects your health, it protects the environment, it protects your workforce health. But it's not just about changing the products you use, it's about changing your approach to cleaning. Now, I understand that most of you are in the educational and workforce development group here, so I'm not gonna get too into the methods of cleaning because uh, I have a couple of slides on that, uh, but I'll just kind of breeze over, you know, summarize really how you do it. But green cleaning really looks at the whole process of cleaning. It's a very different approach to cleaning. Sometimes it's a little bit more labor intensive uh, because the products aren't as, if they're not as toxic, sometimes they're not as the time needed to like leave it on the surface takes a little bit longer than something like a conventional product that has more toxic components in it. So sometimes you just really have to change the method. But um, choosing alternative cleaners um, with accompanying the SDS to make sure that they are safer for you, um, that's one of the cornerstones. Reviewing the product literature to understand how to use the product, that's the key. And then asking vendors for training materials because the vendors of green cleaning and really any product will provide you with information on exactly how to use it. And then on the label too, it will say, okay, these are the directions. But be honest, I mean, there's been probably all of us have just sprayed something and never looked at the, the real way you're supposed to apply a product, right? Um, so paying attention to that. But if you want to identify when you go, next time you go to the store, how do I know, other than looking at the active ingredient, like I just mentioned, how do you know which one's safe? Well, it will have these certifications on there. So EPA has a program called Safer Choice, where Safer Choice relies on third-party certification by different organizations to certify that a product is safe and environmentally friendly, okay? It goes through a rigorous process. Um, and these are the labels that you wanna identify. Eco logo, green seal, or sometimes it will say safer choice or EPA design for the environment. Um, the rigorous certification process allows um, EPA to vet the products based on their chemistry. Um, the key features of green products are biodegradable in the environment, low volatile organic compounds, meaning that's what you smell. When you smell candle burning, when you smell fabuloso, that is a volatile organic compound. It's going from a liquid to a gas. Just like when you open up a paint can, you're smelling what we call a VOC. So any product that's green is going to have a low VOC. So it's not going to have a lot of smell associated with it. 
Um, low impact on air, uh, indoor air quality. So because it's low VOC, it won't have a high impact on indoor air quality because it's not filling up the room with a smell and with that gas. Um, it's non-irritant to users and occupants, and it's very concentrated. So green cleaners tend to be more concentrated that you actually have to follow the directions to dilute. So let's do another question. True or false? It doesn't matter what cleaners and disinfectants you use as long as you use something. So I'll give you a minute to answer that question. True or false? And you can put it in the chat. You're right. Thank you. False. It's really important what you use. All right. It doesn't matter what it, it does matter what you use. So this statement is false. Thank you. They're all listening. Perfect. All right. Um, okay. So choosing alternative cleaners. Uh, we really want to consider this is more geared towards someone who's managing a custodial staff. But um, in a nutshell, um, you know, making sure the staff is trained on how to use the cleaners is key. Because, you know, so often we're still used to using the conventional things that don't require a lot of mixing and a lot of preparation. Uh, but if you're really, you know, gung-ho about switching to a green cleaning program, you need to have training and making sure everyone understands how to use it to make it effective. Um, and this is just another, when you're transitioning to green cleaning, and this is why we, you know, we made this um, training available in three languages to make sure we reach every single individual, make it available to everyone to reach every audience. Um, training workers who are multilingual or English as a second language is very important to make sure things are being uh, used appropriately to make sure they're effective. Um, you don't have to use disinfectants every time you clean. Again, I think we had a lot of problems in the beginning of COVID because we were over disinfecting. Uh, green cleaners, you know, they're effective. They are just as effective as traditional cleaners, but sometimes you got to allow them to sit a little bit longer. Um, sometimes they don't bubble and foam. They don't smell. Um, a lot of them are odorless. So these are just the differences between the two. Again, they're just as effective and obviously more, you know, uh, safer for you to use as from a human health perspective and an environmental perspective, but they're just different. Um, I'm just going to kind of really go through this quickly, but these are just some of the um, activities that you would do if you're a green cleaning. A lot of um, reuse of cloths, okay, because obviously that's a lot more environmentally friendly than a paper towel. So microfiber cloths are great for green cleaning. Um, for hard floor cleaning, um, mats and entrances are always key, which most places do, which um, is less dirt, right? Carpet cleaning, um, typically carpet cleaning as far as a green version goes, usually is using um, just hot water and not any chemicals because sometimes the chemicals can cause indoor air issues. Uh, again, I'm gonna kind of go through this pretty quickly, but um, this can be applicable to your home when you're cleaning a bathroom, um, always ventilate. Um, use green cleaners, of course. Uh, wear gloves. Uh, the ventilation will take care of any type of inhalation exposure. Um, do the dry cleaning first. Uh, allow green cleaners to sit there in order to disinfect. Allow disinfectants to sit there a couple of minutes before you wipe them down. Now here is, that's the fomite I was talking about, that nice picture we all see everywhere. Um, but in the era of COVID, the disinfection that we're doing, really what it is, is a product that kills most organisms, all right, except some bacterial spores. So these things that we're using are all registered pesticides designed to kill COVID, okay? When there is a health situation, especially an outbreak like we've seen, the aim is no, really no longer cleaning. The focus is on disinfecting. We have to kill the pathogen because the risk from someone dying is severe, all right? Um, so disinfecting is important, especially during COVID, but doing it appropriately is what we're trying to tell everyone so that we're not overly exposing ourselves to the dangerous chemicals that I mentioned earlier. Um, always clean with detergent and soap. Uh, high touch surfaces, high contact surfaces only. Uh, what they've found is that, um, so initially when COVID hit, right, like I said, we were just disinfecting everything, right? Like my husband wouldn't even touch his mail for a week. And I was trying to explain to him, I said, listen, it's not going to live on the paper for 10 days. All right. But I think a lot of people had that. No one knew. It was just, we, we were just scared. Well, the science is out now and that the transmission of fomites on surfaces is not as high or not as 
important as the fomite transmission via inhalation, like from someone coughing or breathing next to you, and then you inhale that, okay? So surfaces, while they're important, can still transmit fomites are not as important as we initially thought. So I think getting that message out there so that we're not overly exposed to disinfecting cleaning products, especially the ones that are dangerous, um, if we can reduce that exposure and we're over cleaning. Uh, killing the virus. So maintain routine cleaning with high touch surfaces. Dis disinfecting effectiveness, right, um, can be adversely affected if we don't clean first. Uh, because of this, we have to clean before we disinfect. If you do not, you do not have to use bleaches or disinfectant, but if you do, make sure that none of the ingredients in your cleaner react with bleach. Ventilate while cleaning. And be aware of the time each disinfectant takes to kill the virus. Other steps, especially in buildings when you're dealing with facilities staff, housekeeping staff, never put a disinfectant into the HVAC system because uh, that will actually cause toxic fumes to be released in the indoor air. Um, you know, making sure your place of work or, you know, the staff, you know, are regularly changing the filters. The survival of the virus is reduced by higher temperatures and higher humidity. Um, so HVAC can actually play a huge role. Uh, but if a space or building hasn't been used in seven days, it's pretty, pretty safe to say that the virus is not there. Because remember, the virus has to be on an organic, like a cell, something that's alive in order to replicate. So it doesn't, it doesn't feed on metal, it doesn't feed on plastic. It has to live in something that's alive in order to be transmitted. Um, so beyond personal hand sanitizers, uh, in your setting, wherever you are, in your office, in your school, there should be a policy that, um, or your organization, there should be a policy that don't allow staff to bring in any cleaning and disinfecting products that, that, aren't, that aren't approved or used by the janitorial staff that regularly cleans the space. Because what happens is you may be bringing in unsafe things. We have a lot of issues with teachers that we found um, in like high schools. We've been working a lot with high schools with this grant program. Teachers bringing in their own Lysol wipes teachers bringing in their own, you know, disinfecting uh, solutions. And it's a constant battle with the, you know, the, ho the housekeeping, I mean, the uh, janitorial staff, because they're like, no, 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 the, the state doesn't allow bleach to be used in schools. That's actually a law. And they're having a problem because they keep on bringing bleach wipes in. So it's like a constant battle. Um, so especially in schools, that is not allowed because children are higher risk just because of their age um, for asthmogens. They're just a, a high risk population. Um, this kind of pertains to, there are types of disinfectants that can be fogged and mist in buildings, but you know, th this is just making sure you're following the application um, instructions for fogging and misting uh, because sometimes uh, they can actually cause more problems than not. Um, so I'll just kind of breeze through that because, you know. Um, all right, so this is EPA's list of, uh, registered antimicrobial products that kill COVID. So the link right here on this slide will take you right to the end list and you can maybe check on it after. All right, um, it will take you right to the end list and you'll see all this list of things, right? It will tell you what kills COVID um, and then that's it, okay? What we've done at DEM and what another state has done in San Francisco is we've screened that same list and we've highlighted the products that are bad and the products that are good. And we've put links to the SDS sheet. So if anyone's interested in that, um, it's a pretty big file, but I can share it with you. Uh, that will soon be on our website too. But uh, we've just said, okay, we're gonna highlight all the ones that are safe, highlight all the ones that like have the bad stuff and have the good stuff so you can make your own decision. Um, but EPA also on their website does have the list to the safer active disinfectant ingredients. The problem is it's just not part of the, the major, what we call the end list. So, you know, I'm just trying to make it easier for the user by kind of screening that list and get making it available to the public so people can easily maybe go through it and find products. But you'll see that, you know, about 80% of the ingredients on that list are the ones I just went over, the quats, the bleach, and the phenols. Um, we don't want to use those. What we want to use are the ones that are advocated by EPA safer active ingredient and by the Toxic Use Reduction Institute, which are hydrogen peroxide based disinfectants, 
alcohol, isopropyl alcohol or ethanol, citric acid or lactic acid. If you see those as the active ingredient in any disinfectant, you are safe. Those are the safe group, okay? Those have been vetted by EPA to be the safer active um, disinfectant ingredient. And they have been promoted by many organizations like PEM, uh, Toxic Use Reduction Institute. The whole idea is getting people to know this information so they can make um, a, a, a wise decision when they are buying products for their home, office, school, what have you. And then let's just go back to the third party certification again. Um, I don't have the URL for that list I just mentioned, but it, I, I will have it up on the website soon. But um, you know, make sure you look for the green seal, the eco logo. These links right here, you can go right to these uh, that will take you right to those pages of those organizations. And you can, think, you can see for yourself how they do that. But anything with the green seal or eco logo certification is a safe product for the environment. And this is just some extra resources for you. I'm just, this is about my last slide. Um, if you wanna go on any of these, you know, to kind of breeze through, but here's, uh, we call it Turi. Here's Turi's website, the Toxic Use Reduction Institute. Uh, there's a ton of valuable information for housekeeping janitorial staff there. Uh, this is two dec decades of testing, actually testing products. You can mail a product to them. They will test its efficacy and tell you whether or not you should be using an alternative chemical. So there are a wealth of information. Uh, there's another website here, Informs Cleaning for Health Project aims to protect custodial workers, students, and other building occupants. San Francisco Department of Environment, they kind of did something similar to us where they looked at the list of EPA approved products and tried to make some extra information for the public so they could have more information determining uh, safer products versus um, the more you know, toxic to human health and environment products. And then greenhealth.org, uh, a lot of solutions for healthcare sector workers uh, to create better, safer, greener workplaces for the community. So that's just some extra resources there. Uh, this is just acknowledgements. We don't have to go through that, but uh, this is all the information that we use to write the training. And then lastly, um, just as a disclaimer, because this is federally funded, uh, this project is um, does not necessarily reflect views and policies of the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the EPA does not endorse trade names. So the product that I mentioned on here, that's not endorsed. That is not, uh, but you know, by any means by the state or the federal government, it's just, I'm just trying to show you, uh, provide information on things. Um, so there's a little disclaimer there, uh, but I am finished. So I tried to be efficient there. Hopefully I didn't talk too quickly, uh, but I wanted to skim over things that I didn't think were necessarily maybe applicable to this audience and focus more on you know the things that were. Uh, if you have any questions, I can stop sharing this and we can kind of have a little quick discussion before 1130. Yeah. And actually I have a question. Sure. This, it got, I have to say when you were talking, especially about <clears throat> the classroom piece and teachers bringing things in and um, yeah, I was like, oh yeah. So, um, so I guess I'm also wondering if you're, say you were traveling, you're getting on an airplane, you're going to go someplace. Um, how can, how, it's not a question of how concerned, should you bring something with you to sort of disinfect your space? I mean, how, what, what's, what should you be doing at that point? I mean, obviously somebody's done it before you, what do you, what do you do and should you do anything? Um, yeah. This I think the CDC, I mean, you know, all those places are following, it should be following the CDC guidance uh, for surfaces. But I mean, I think it just goes back to what the CDC says, wash your hands regularly, um, right. you know, washing before you're using hand sanitizer, right? Of mm -hmm. course, that's not always possible. Sometimes right. we're on our way out and we just squirt hand sanitizer on us. I think that's just the most important thing. Um, you know, like I said, the surfaces are they've been found to be less of an issue than, I mean, they're still an issue. I don't want, but they're less of an issue what we initially thought. It's more right. of the inhalation, breathing, small closed spaces. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, just what you've probably been normally doing, washing your hands, using sanitizer, um, but using sanitizer that is safe <laughs> because some of the sanitizers that they've found, especially ones that are manufactured outside of the US and China and Mexico actually have, I don't know if you saw some stories, they have some pretty uh, concerning ingredients in there um, because they are imports. So this goes back again to 
you know, pushing this message out there to everyone because, you know, the, the federal government cannot keep up with the pace of products importing, exporting and, man, you know, being manufactured to really um, do its job, which is it's hard, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question. They, so, OK, sounds good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> sure. Nadia. Um, I'm just wondering how effective are these um, homemade products like vinegar with water in disinfecting or like lemon, uh, you know, like, yeah, we... I actually, so I use that too. I have like, you know, vinegar water. It's, it's definitely obviously environmentally safe and um, uh, preferable because vinegar is not in any way, shape or form toxic, right? We can eat it. So um, as far as if it's, well, I use it in my house, but not to, with the goal of disinfecting for COVID, right? Only certain things are registered to kill COVID. Um, but hydrogen peroxide is one of those active ingredients in products that can kill COVID. And that's something that you can easily, you know, probably do something with. Um, I don't have a lot of information about do-it-yourself do cleaning and, and if it's effective. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure those, those resources that are on that slide will have uh, some additional information for you. Hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, so I have um, an account with in the background trying to copy me, <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> but um, I buy from, I don't know if you've heard, Grove Collaborative. And yeah. It's a, yeah, so I buy my products through there, and they're all safer products, which is nice yep. because you don't have to go searching everywhere. They have mm -hmm. all of the different things. So I just, if anyone hasn't heard it, you might want to check it out. I've heard of that. Yeah, I've heard that they're pretty good. Yeah, and then they have like little specials. Like when I first joined, I got all these free products. But then, um, oh, so sorry. You have like an account and then you, you know, um, you have to order monthly if for free shipping over a certain amount, but then you can hold, if you don't have anything that month, you can just hold off. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it's like a program you, you join and mm -hmm. then you get free product too. It's pretty good. And they yeah. send you a little handwritten note. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> I don't know how big the operation is, but I'm like, wow, they're so personal. Yeah, that's nice. And those products are all third-party certified. They all have the eco logo and the green seal. So there you go with your way to identify if they're safe. Cool. Any other questions from anybody? Hmm. How do we access the Spanish version? Okay, so, um, and I, Nadia, you said you're from Progreso Latino? Yes. Okay, yes. all right, so I'm really happy that you're on here because I know that that's like a workforce development program and Kathy mentioned the um, translation. Um, so it's almost being wrapped up. Um, what I'm trying to do is, so it's been translated, but what I now need to do is hire the translation group to do a voiceover of the training. Once I have the voiceover on the slides, anyone can use it. I can send it to Progresso Latino. I can send it to West Bay Collab, whatever. Whoever wants to use it will be able to use it because then it will just be a matter of, you know, anyone can watch it whenever they need to. Um, the I'll provide my notes to a translator to have a voiceover so that it can be spoken in the three languages that we're, uh, we're targeting. Okay. So I would say within a month, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to, I, it's already been translated, but if I was to give you a, a time frame, within a month's time, I'll have it up on our DEM website and I can certainly send it to anyone who wants to, uh, you know, push it out to their constituents. And would it make sense for me to just share your email address with everyone on the call who may or may not have it and then they can get in touch with you directly? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, and then I have. I have everyone's email who's on the call because it's in the Zoom link. So I will, um, I have that too. I'm trying to build up like almost like a listserv of people who would be, you know, interested in hearing more. Um, but yes, please share that. Um, okay. Cause I would really like, again, I, you know, I know there's only, you know, a total of five of us here today, but I would really, you know, we're trying to do as much training as we possibly can. Uh, the grant, this grant that's funding this project 
technically ends in September, but uh, the resources available for training will be available through the end of the year. So I really wanna utilize the time that I have to get the message out there um, and be able to engage with people to answer questions and things like that. Sounds good. That sounds good. It, it, it is so much, you know, it, I guess I always realize like how, how unaware I am sometimes of certain things or don't think a lot of it. And then I listen to something like that and think, hmm, I need to pay more attention. So yeah, um, I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. And um, if you have any questions, you can email me and follow up and I can help you in any way I can. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good Thank weekend. You. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye -bye. Oh, Joan. Yes. Um, while you're here. <laughs> yep. You know what? Hold on a second. Let me find my recording thing. Oh, yes, yes. Before, before we have a whole conversation and uh